<laughs> but anyway, I finally told the guy I couldn't stand up. The Oberfeld way will come in. He says, "Cook everything you got. We're leaving in the morning." They giving us giving us a half a cow for 500 men. Wow. 500 men. I was. Uh, I made another can of barley, and I gave it to my buddy. We were sleeping in the hayloft. That night. That night. I lost my long underwear. I was up in the hayloft, snow on the ground, and it just no control. So I told my buddy Harold, Harold, when I got back, I said, you know, and about five minutes later, I had to go again, and I lost my pants, but it was my only pair of pants. So the morning, that morning, or that night, over the sun trench, I finally got up to where the kitchen was and I washed the pants in cold water. The next morning I stood roll call in a snowstorm with a pair of boxer shorts on and a GI overcoat. But uh, that, that's what, what happened to you. Uh, dysentery was rampant. We had one doctor from Detroit, Dr. Kaplan. He didn't have no medicine. He had a few uh, sulfur pills. He said, don't wash your feet because they won't pr provide transportation for you. Uh, I, when, I, when we started to walk, I always tried to get at the head of the line because by the end of the day, I might be at the end. But I started out in the front. I didn't have to worry about being at the end because they, they might not provide transportation for you. <laughs> and uh, there's a book that I have here. Uh, let's see if I can get it. It's right on top there. Yeah. No, no film. Right underneath the leg. Yeah. Yes, sir. If, any, if anybody likes to read, this is a book that is a story of the ex prisoners of the ex prisoners of war who walk for 89 days. Uh, I'm part of it, and. Uh, it's, uh, I was going to read some parts out of it, but I think I've covered enough of it. But it's very interesting. We had, we had one guard, uh, a German guy that was in the First World War. They called him Big Stoop. He was about six foot six, 260 pounds. And he was the enforcer in camp. We didn't dare look at him cross-eyed. If he hit you on the side of the head, he might break an eardrum. He had he had broken eardrums. I called them ham hands. He had hams that hands that were unusually big. But in this book, the guys got him. The guys got him after the war. Yeah. They got him. They yeah. didn't forget. Yeah. There, there's there's stories, so I'm not going to go into that. But the POW has got him because he he was just terrible. Just trying to think if I can think of any other stories. What's the name of the book? It's The Last Escape. It's by uh, It's The Last Escape by two British authors, um, John Nichol and Tony Randall, Tony Rennell. And it's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, we were we were uh, we uh, walked for the 89 days, and when we finally got to where we were going to stay, it was. Did anybody ever hear of Bergen, Bergen Belsen? Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. We didn't know it at that time, but thousands of Jews were killed in that camp. Well, the Germans walked us right by that camp, but what we didn't know, they took us down the road about three miles and put us in a camp that was just as bad. It was called Falling Bosco. They marched us in there and put us in a circus tent Five, six, five, six hundred of us, straw on the ground, and uh, we got uh, uh, one big potato a day, maybe two small potatoes, maybe a slice of bread, and a can of head, can of dehydrated grass soup, kohlrabi's, whatever they could get. In that camp, every day, the meat wagon would go out with bodies. That camp was started in 1939, and some of the prisoners in there were from Dunkirk. Anybody remember Dunkirk? They were British, British in there. And I took one walk over there, and I couldn't go back. 
they were walking sticks. And they had one light, one light bulb in each room. They were using the wood of their slats of their bed to build little fires, to cook anything they could get a hold of. One trip was all I could do. I just couldn't go back because every day they would take out, maybe twice a day, a trailer full of bodies. We were told that Falling Bosco was a staging ground for Berg and Belson. But one thing, the war was almost over. We got there and spent about 10 days, and we could hear the English guns in the west, so they walked us back the other way. 28 days, we walked back east, and we were finally liberated liberated by the British on May 2nd of 1945. When you get a chance, talk about your liberation. What do you remember about that day? Who came for you? What were your thoughts? Well, it was, a, it was quite a day because uh, the British had told us to go to the next town when they liberated us and we could get some food. But there was thousands of people on the highway, thousands of us. The Germans at that time had over 200,000 prisoners in, in their country. They had 93, over 93,000 Americans, over 93. Uh, the Eighth Air Force lost more, more personnel than any other group in the service. The Eighth Air Force lost 53,000 men. 29,000 of them were from the Eighth, from the Eighth Air Force. 29,000 guys. When they first started the supply, I just wanted to mention this. We did. I didn't realize how bad it was, but the 91st Bomb Group and the 41st Bomb, 401 Bomb Group, were the first two groups to go over there in November of 43. The 91st, 91st had the Memphis Bell. Anybody ever hear the Memphis Bell? The Memphis Bell was in the 91st, and the Memphis Bell was the first airplane to get 25 missions in. But let me tell you how tough it was. How tough it was. When we went overseas, we named our airplanes. When the 91st got over, one crew named their, their crew the Short, Short Snorter. Anybody that went overseas could get a $2 bill, could get a $2 bill, and start a short snorter. So they named this airplane, they got shot down. Three of them named their airplanes the short snorter. All three of them, all three of them were shot down. Those three airplanes had a total of 17 missions. 17 missions, and they lost 86% of their personnel. 17 missions, 86%. At that time, you'd have been safer, and no offense to anybody in this audience, you'd have been safer landing on an island in the channel or something like that, because we didn't have long-range fighters at that time in the Germans. When the, when the fighters would leave the, leave the bombers, the German fighters would hit them. And the odds of getting back of finishing were very, very few and far between. But I just wanted to mention that because the Memphis Bell was in that bomb group, the 91st bomb group. I've got a question. George, we've been spending the last few weeks trying to uh, identify what is important about this war to learn. So I really would ask you that question, particularly for our young students who are not you know, all that well versed. What do you think is important for us to take away from this war? Well. I, I've got something I'd like to dig out here just a minute if I can. I, uh, I uh, got involved in a couple of parades one time here in the city of Muskegon. They were looking for ex prisoners of the war, and so I got to ride on a golf cart. A golf cart. I rode backwards for the first time in 68 years again. <laughs> and I told them that this is, it was a nice golf cart, but I said, here I'm riding backwards again. <laughs> anyway, one time we were up there, and I didn't know they wanted they wanted us to uh, uh, tail gunners to say something. I started out one year, there was four of us, and then there was three. And when we had three, they called us up there, and I said, "What do I say?" 
to my fellow men. What do I say to my fellow men? I put it this way. I was only one of 15 million to serve my country. I was only one of 15. I had a job to do. We all had a job to do, and we did it. The people stayed home. The people stayed home. 20, 30 million and made the munitions for us so we could fight. And so my, my only message to you here in the audience is wars, wars settle nothing. Wars settle nothing, they just make enemies. And I think of my, my comrade Pete, lost his life, lost his life over war. And that's the only thing I can say. But today I found something that might be of interest uh, about this march. If you, if you would let me, I would like to read it to you. It's in this, it's in this book, but you want to go 90 days. <laughs> we didn't have a mirror. So it wasn't good. It couldn't have been good. But this, this guy writes about that. He was, uh, there was a mud puddle, and he looked in that mud puddle, and he saw him, a reflection of himself. He couldn't believe it. And this is what he wrote. A prisoner's story about the march. As I stared into that icy pool of water, a question, why was I here? Why me, I ask. In his own reflection, he saw all the horrors of war and the indignation that only man can force upon another man. For weeks, he had noticed his companions. Uh, in, they were deteriorating into thin, pale, wild-eyed creatures. They were, they were now but his mind had fooled him into thinking that it was not happening to him. I was a shock to see myself. So I really was, and I, I had to realize I was in the same as they were. He didn't even realize it. He didn't have a mirror to look, and he saw himself in the water, and that's what he looked like. And he wrote that. That's in the book, and I, I thought it would be nice to, to bring that out. Yeah. But that's, that's the only thing I can say. The war is war said on nothing. I wish I knew the answer. Nobody knows the answer. Nobody knows the answer. Well, I think we can certainly say that you've earned and you've always had our undying respect, and we all thank you very much, and I think a nice ovation.